Hello, we are back again, and we're going to dive into more of Yangshul Han's The Disappearance of Rituals. Um, so I want to say that I think different presentations of philosophy and philosophical discussions can be really helpful. Everyone has its pros and cons, right? I mean, I think that those sort of lectures that are kind of all summarizing a philosopher or um, a text of a, a philosopher can be really helpful, especially if it inspires you to go read the text for yourself and not just know the commentary. Um, but I also think that, you know, what I'm doing, which is with, at least with Byung Chul Han's books, um, because I really want to go over them myself and make sure that I understand the thoughts that he has. And I just want to share his thoughts because I think he's, he really makes you think. Um, it can be helpful because it's more like an audio book, like you're listening to the actual text with pauses and commentary. Something else I have planned to do, especially particularly with Spinoza's ethics, since I'm doing a reading group on it, is show the text and then point out some specific things according to how I understand it and my interpretation, and hopefully get all of your thoughts as well. Um, but I want to read a little bit more of the ethics before I do that, just to kind of see you know, just make sure I have a hold on his concepts. All right, so that said, you can tell me in the comments which kind of, and I left some out, of course, but which kind of philosophical presentations and discussions and formats you like best and why, and I will take that as personal feedback, take it into consideration. All right, so this chapter is called The Compulsion of Authenticity. I think he is going to critique this. All right, the society of authenticity is a performance society. All members perform themselves, all produce themselves. Everyone pays homage to the cult of the self, the worship of self in which everyone is his or her own priest. So I'm getting here thoughts of narcissism, and uh, it seems a, quite in line with what many of us do on social media, um, sort of branding ourselves and making ourselves into content. And um, I recently, I can't remember where I heard this, something about uh, how social media that promotes content. It was a YouTube video critiquing full, okay, I think I mentioned this last time. Um, it was on that video, so I don't remember if I mentioned this in another video of mine. But it was the video on YouTube that is critiquing those who talk about philosophy but want to be influencers. He says that in those situations, the content is, well, the presentation is more about the person presenting than the actual content. So I think that's an interesting differentiation divide. So I think that what this passage so far makes me think of. All right, Charles Taylor credits the modern cult of authenticity with a, mor with a moral force. And you can kind of ask yourself, what, at what points in history has authenticity even been a concept that would make sense to people based on, you know, the time that people had to think about these things and the concept an understanding of individuals versus community and individuals within community, because not all points in history would authenticity, a person's authenticity make sense. 
quote, being true to myself means being true to my own originality, and that is something only I can articulate and discover. In articulating it, I am also defining myself. I am realizing a potentiality that is properly my own. This is the background understanding to the modern ideal of authenticity and to the goals of self-fulfillment or self-realization in which it is usually couched. This is the background that gives moral force to the culture of authenticity, including its most degraded, absurd, or trivialized forms. So according to this Charles Taylor, um, there's probably a more pure, less problematic state of authenticity. The so back to Byung Chul Han, the creation of self, however, must not be self-centered. It has to take place against the backdrop of a social horizon of meaning that gives the act of self-creation a relevance that transcends the self. So it can't be, authenticity can't just be for itself, I guess. Um, and I don't know if here Byung Chul Han, because I do get confused sometimes when Byung Chul Han is describing the counterpoint and when he is professing what he thinks. So I don't know if he's just clarifying Charles Taylor, what he's saying, or he's advancing a thought of his own. I think it's the former. I think he's clarifying and not agreeing with necessarily, we'll see. Quote, only if I exist in a world in which history or the demands of nature or the needs of my fellow human beings or the duties of citizenship or the call of God, okay, clarification, or something else of this order matters crucially, can I define an identity for myself that is not trivial? So it has to, we have to be connecting to the wider audience. Authenticity is not the enemy of demands that emanate from beyond the self. It supposes such demands, end quote. From this perspective, authenticity and community are not mutually exclusive. Taylor distinguishes between the form and content of authenticity. Self-referentiality only concerns its form, namely the form of self-fulfillment. According to Taylor, its content, by contrast, must not be self-centered. So can you imagine an authenticity that is not self-centered? I guess we could think about being authentic with others, um, and the idea that if we are authentic with ourselves, then we're presenting, um, you know, that to the world in a way where maybe we can liberate others or we can create more intimate relationships, et cetera. Taylor distinguished, oh, hold on, sorry. Authenticity only proves itself insofar as the identity created contains an explicit reference to a community and so is able to hold true independent of one's own self. Contrary to Taylor's assumptions, however, authenticity is in fact the enemy of community. So, the young chuhol. Young Chul Han just wants to um, be on a definite side. The narcissism of authenticity undermines community. Um, so Char I guess um, Taylor is trying to create a space for non-self-centered authenticity. Young Chul Han is apparently saying it cannot be done. The narcissist, okay, so in terms of its content, what is crucial is not its reference to a community or some other higher order, but its market value. So in our world, authenticity is tied up with consumerism, which effaces all other values. Thus, the form and content of authenticity coincide. Both concern the self. The cult of authenticity shifts the question of identity from society to the individual person. Within the cult of authenticity, the production of self becomes a permanent activity. Authenticity thus atomizes society. 
Taylor's moral justification of authenticity ignores that subtle process. Within the neoliberal regime, by which the ideas of freedom and self-realization are transformed into vehicles for more efficient exploitation. So Taylor doesn't realize the, um, I don't know, the evils of, of what he's um, promoting as a potential virtue if done the right way. The neoliberal regime exploits morality. Once it is able to present itself as freedom, domination becomes complete. So we are, if we are striving toward authenticity, there must be some sort of freedom or we are, whenever I think of, of, the, of that sort of journey, I think of, well, maybe Heidegger, being authentic is pulling some, pulling the self out of one's conformity to the masses. So it seems like the more authentic you are, the more free you are and you, you are enacting your freedom, perhaps. Authenticity is a neoliberal form of production. You exploit yourself voluntarily in the belief that you are realizing yourself. In the cult of authenticity, the neoliberal regime appropriates the person himself and turns him into a highly efficient site of production. The whole person is incorporated into the production process. The cult of authenticity is an obvious sign of the decay of the social. Quote, when someone is judged to be authentic or when society as a whole is described as creating problems of human authenticity, the language reveals one way in which social action is being devalued in the process of placing more weight on psychological matters." End quote. The compulsion of authenticity leads to narcissistic introspection, a permanent occupation with one's own psychology. Communication is also organized psychologically. The society of authenticity is a society of intimacy and exposure, the nudism of the soul into which we are encouraged lends society a pornographic character. So I guess the idea of pornography is in this context, or in all contexts, I suppose, um, is sort of the blatant raw revealing of something, the body, but it could be sort of anything. Um, and so that's what, I guess, if I'm an authentic person, maybe I'm laying everything out on the table and I, you know, I mean, I guess a lot of videos talking about the self and talking about one's life Young Chohan would, would critique in this way. Social relations are more genuine and authentic the more intimate they are, the more they reveal what was private. It's an interesting turn there. The society of the 18th century was still dominated by ritual forms of interaction. The public space resembled a stage, a theater. The body also represented a stage. It was a dressed puppet without soul, without psychology, that had to be draped and decorated and fitted out with signs and symbols. The wig framed a face like a painting. The fashion itself was theatrical and people were properly in love with scenic presentations. A lady's coiffure, co co that's, that's probably not the right pr pronunciation. Coffee? Coffee? I don't know. Was also designed as a scene uh, representing either, I think, the hair, right? Um, either a historical event or an emotion. And it says in parentheses, pouf à la circonstance, pouf au sentiment. These emotions, however, did not reflect conditions of the soul. 
the emotions were mainly played with. The face itself became a stage on which various characters were represented with the help of beauty spots. If they were placed at the corner of the eye, they meant passion. Placed on the lower lip, they indicated the frankness of the wearer. The face understood as a stage is utterly remote from the face, from that face we find presented today on Facebook. <laughs> So, um, so the selfie. So that's interesting because I think a lot of conversations about fashion revolve around the idea that you are expressing yourself, that you are being artistic and expressing who you are. It's kind of revealing something um, externally that is, is inner sometimes. Um, so Byung Chul Han is kind of creating a space for the glory of, again, the performance, right? So this is why I feel like he needs another word for when he's critiquing performance and when he's loving it. The 19th century discovered work and play became increasingly distrusted. There was now much more work than play. The world resembled a factory, so here we get into capitalism, consumerism, rather than a theater. The culture of the, the of the theatrical presentation gave way to the culture of interiority. This development can also be seen in fashion. Stage costumes and ordinary clothes began to differ more and more. The theatrical element disappeared from fashion. Europeans started to wear work clothes. And that's interesting because I often think that one of the contrasts between Catholicism and Protestantism is the transition from ritual and performance and kind of what Byung Chul Han is talking about, the external um, to an order, to uh, the Protestant interiority and individual relationship with God. Quote, never had an age taken itself with more pretentious seriousness. Culture ceased to be played. Outward forms were no longer intended to give the appearance, the fiction, if you like, of a higher ideal mode of life. There is no more striking symptom of the decline of the play factor than the disappearance of everything imaginative, fanciful, fantastic from men's dress after the French Revolution. So we're dressing to be practical and get things done. In the course of the 19th, so back to Byung, in the course of the 19th century, men's clothes became increasingly homogenous. They became standardized like work uniforms. If the condition of a society can be read off of its fashion, then the, uh, that's kind of a Hegelian move, right? Because the spirit of the age kind of infects every aspect of it. If the condition of a society can be read off of its fashion, off its fashion, then the increasingly pornographic nature of fashion reflects an increasingly pornographic society. I wonder if my video is going to get flagged because of that word. It's, it's not my fault. More flesh is displayed than form. With the rise of the cult of authenticity, tattoos have also become fashionable again. So interesting, tattoos, tattoos are not um, sort of, how is he talking about fashion just now? Um, theatrical, being in, love with this, being in love with a scenic representation, but I guess tattoos are supposed to in the modern day, represent who you are and be highly attached to your identity and your individuality. Within a ritual context, they symbolize the alliance between individual and community. So thinking more about instead of just the regular everyday tattoo, tattoos that 
truly have symbolic meaning within a community, a culture. In the 19th century, when tattoos were very popular, especially among the upper classes, the body was still a surface onto which yearnings and dreams were projected. Today, tattoos lack any symbolic power. All they do is point to the uniqueness of the bearer. I mean, they could be symbolic for the person. All they do, okay, sorry. The body is neither a ritual stage nor a surface of projection. Rather, it is an advertising space. So I guess we're advertising ourselves. And I guess we could say that even if we are, you know, are we advertising ourselves when we're trying to be likable, when we're trying to reveal who we are? The neoliberal hell of the same is populated with tattooed clones. Which I guess is in a sense true for me because I want to go to South Korea and get some of those like, watercolor floral tattoos. I don't have any tattoos, but I'm ready to get one if I'm ever in South Korea. The cult of authenticity erodes public space, which disintegrates into private spaces. Everyone carries their own private space with them wherever they go. In public space, one has to leave aside the private and play a role. It is a space for scenic presentations, a theater. The play, the drama is essential to it. Sorry, I think I'm, my desk isn't very sturdy, so. <laughs> I'm not looking at myself, so it's hard for me to see how this video, someday, maybe, I will get a sturdier desk and it won't move. Quote, play acting in the form of manners, conventions, oh, and if you're listening to my podcast and not on YouTube, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the computer screen, obviously. All right, um, play acting in the forms of manners, conventions, and ritual gestures is the very stuff out of which public relations are formed and from which public relations derive their emotional meaning. The more social conditions erode the public forum, the more are people routinely inhibited from exercising the capacity to play act. The members of an intimate society become artists deprived of an art, end quote. Today, the world is not a theater in which roles are played and ritual gestures exchanged, but a market in which one exposes and exhibits oneself. Theatrical presentation gives way to a pornographic ex exhibition of the private. Sociability and politeness also make major contributions to theatrical presentation, which again, Byung Chul Han is, feels that our culture is, is losing. They play with a semblance of beauty and thus require a scenic theatrical distance. In the name of authenticity or genuineness, the semblance of beauty, the ritual gesture is today discarded as something purely external. But this genuineness, so, so we're kind of in our modern day society that Han is critiquing, um, the virtue of authenticity would mean that we critique artifice, even artifice upon our bodies. But this genuineness is, in truth, crudeness and barbarity. The narcissistic cult of authenticity is partly responsible for the increasing brutalization of society. We live in a culture of the effect, of the affect. Where ritual gestures and manners decay, effect, affect and emotion gain the upper hand. On social media, too, the scenic distance that is const constitutive constitutive of the public sphere is reduced. 
And the result is affective communication without distance. So this sort of over intimacy that I guess we create with strangers sometimes on social media um, is an actuality very filled with much distance, but maybe it doesn't seem like it because you're inviting people into your home. Like you can see my Christmas tree. I have no, nowhere else to put it, so it's there. The narcissistic cult of authenticity makes us blind to the symbolic force of forms, which exert a substantial influence on emotion and thought. We may imagine a ritual turn that reestablishes the priority of forms. It would invert the relationship between inside and outside, spirit and body. The body moves the spirit, not vice versa. Body does not follow spirit, but spirit follows body. We may also say the medium produces the message. This is a force of ritual. External forms lead to internal changes. So we do kind of go back to the internal. In a way, it's a move to take us out of ourselves and the path that we are going down um, in order to return to ourselves and maybe develop character. That's where I think he might be going. Thus, ritual forms of politeness have mental effects. The semblance of beauty produces a beautiful soul and not vice versa. Quote, polite behavior can strongly influence our thoughts and miming graciousness, kindness, and happiness is of considerable help in combating ill humor and even stomach aches. The movements involved gracious gestures and smiles do this do this much good. They exclude the possibility of contrary movements, which express rage, defiance, and sadness. That is why social activities, visits, formal occasions, and parties are so well liked. It is a chance to imitate happiness. And this kind of comedy certainly frees us from tragedy, no small accomplishment. So that's kind of interesting. So while on the one, on one hand, some people might critique um, sort of the social event of a party as, I wonder if we can even bring the Met Gala into this, because a lot of times the Met Gala gets critiqued as sort of a gratuitous display of wealth and luxury, which is sometimes I guess problematic because of the gap between the rich and the poor or the extremely rich and even just regular middle class um, on the lower end. But I wonder if Byung Chul Han would say that that is, is inspiring. I just wonder what he would say about that in his whole desire to critique capitalism and consumerism. Politeness is, uh, is an, so is it, is it all parties or, you know, um, politeness is an as if ritual. Culture as such is made up of as if rituals. If we remove the as if gestures in the name of authenticity or genuineness, we destroy the element of civilization. Quote, again, in order to feel kindly toward a person to whom we have been inimical, inimical, the only way is more or less deliberately to smile, to make sympathetic in inquiries, and to force ourselves to say genial things. One hearty laugh together will bring enemies into a closer communion of heart than hours spent on both sides in inward wrestling with the mental demon of uncharitable feeling. To wrestle with a bad feeling only pins our attention on it 
and keeps it still fastened in the mind. Whereas if we act as if from some better feeling, the old bad feeling soon folds its tent like an Arab and silently steals away, end quote. Okay. A ritual of politeness is not an expression of subjective feeling. It is an objective act. It resembles a magical intoxic, no, sorry, invocation. My highlighting is very dark here, so sometimes I can't see the word. That produces a positive mental state. The culture of authenticity goes hand in hand with the distrust of ritualized forms of interaction. Only spontaneous emotion, that is a subjective state, is authentic. Behavior that has been formed in some way is denigrated as inauthentic or superficial. So that's kind of interesting. Because I think that, you know, he doesn't mention this, but I think that there is sort of a move to seek out rituals and the aesthetic and magic he mentions, because I think about how popular YouTube channels or content is with sort of like manifestation videos and witchcraft and paganism. And I mean, I myself have, um, you know, often in my life been in search of some sort of a, a ritual for my life that can create meaning. And I think that, you know, paganism does, does offer that in a sense, because you have your own individual rituals, but then you have your community rituals as well, if you desire them or can find them. But, you know, every sort of season or area or point in, the wheel of the year sort of has its symbolic sense and flowers and foods and sort of spells and activities and, you know, tarot or oracle spreads. And I think the reason that all of this is really, I mean, I think that Byung Chul Han, what he's saying, um, kind of does key into a longing for some kind of spirituality. But yet I'm not sure that the alternative, perhaps, perhaps, to traditional religion. I don't know if he talks about religion in here. Explicitly. Okay, that's chapter four. All right, so let's go on a little more. In a society of authenticity, actions are guided internally, motivated psychologically, whereas in ritual societies, actions are determined by externalized forms of interactions. I bet Byung Chul Han would say, in a world of rituals that was highly ritualized, the rate of mental illness would go down. I just feel like he would think that. Rituals make the world objective. They mediate our relation to the world. The compulsion of authenticity, by contrast, makes everything subjective, thereby intensifying narcissistic tendencies. Today, narcissistic disorders are on the rise because we are increasingly losing the ability to conduct social interactions outside the boundaries of the self. The narcissistic Homo psychologicus is captivated by itself, caught in an intricate inwardness. What results is a poverty in world, with the self simply circling around itself. Thus, Homo psychologicus falls into a depression. All right, I promise I didn't read ahead, like say that. I, I didn't know. But... 
All right, I guess Byung Chul Han and I are on the same page on this page. In a culture of, or at least meaning I understand where he's going with it. In a culture of raging narcissism, playfulness disappears and life loses its cheerfulness and exuberance. I remember reading an Alan Watts book, Become What You Are. And in it, he says that he also critiques sort of the lack of light heartedness in our world. In a world, I think, where so many people are struggling, where there is this gap between, you know, people who are having more money than they could ever spend in their lifetime and others, most of us who are, you know, wishing we had a little more money to have a little more comfort and living paycheck to paycheck, et cetera. Worried that if we ever get sick, we're not going to be able to pay for it. Um, that would just might be the United States. I don't know. But um, he was saying that the gods, a main, an essential characteristic of the gods, if, you know, whoever they are, um, if, you know, they exist, is most likely lightheartedness and joy. Which sounds kind of menacing looking at the suffering of the world, but I thought it was rather revelatory when I read it. Okay. Um, the culture retreats from that holy sphere of play. And really interesting, like when you, I am somewhat reading um, or rereading um, Jaya Govinda's The Song of the Dark Lord, which is about Krishna. And in Hinduism, it's really interesting because a lot of the gods have very playful aspects to them and you'll read about the gods in different stories and um, they do have kind of a lightheartedness to certain aspects of their personalities or certain certain avatars of certain gods are you know more lighthearted than others so to connect play with the sacred i think is an interesting move that is not new. The compulsions of work and performance intensify the, the profanation of life, so the profane. The holy seriousness of play gives way to the profane seriousness of work. James Bond movies also reflect this development. They have become more serious and less playful over time. I've never seen a James Bond movie. The most recent ones even forego the depiction of rituals of carefree love at the end. The final scene of Skyfall has a disturbing effect in this regard. Bond, instead of dedicating himself to amorous play, simply receives his next assignment from his superior. M.M. says to Bond, lots to be done. Are you ready to get back to work? A stern-faced Bond replies, with pleasure, M, with pleasure. The ritual spaces that make possible, possible playful and ceremonial exuberance have been eroded. So that's interesting, doing this sort of cultural, like pop culture reference. Zizek does that quite a bit. I need to read another Zizek book I have, one that I haven't read yet in, on my shelf. I wonder if Byung Chul Han would critique the evolution of movies that aim for political correctness and modification of potential potential elements that would offend. I just wonder. Because I just have a theory, even though I haven't seen James Bond movies, that um, they are perhaps evolving to align with 
sort of demands of correctness, like sort of the virtues that are circulating perhaps today, progressively. They have become spaces of excess and extravagance that stand out against the profane everyday life. Culture has been made profane. Films like Le Grand Bouffe would today only be left with incomprehension. I'm gonna have to look that movie up. Transgression is a general feature of celebratory ritual. It, the cult, so quote, it, the culture, orders and creates exceptional celebratory situations in which what may be usually, in, in which what may usually be denied now suddenly seems called for and can be experienced in ceremonies of transgression as cheerful sociability, as joyful triumph, or even as wild enthusiasm totemistic societies that prohibited the eating of certain animals provide a striking example, one which Freud was familiar. On a particular day of the year, the prohibition is lifted and instead it is commanded that on that day, the totem feast must be held a joyful occasion. So kind of an ecstatic bacchanal of releasing our repressed Selves, perhaps. The profanation of culture brings about its disenchantment. Today, the arts are also increasingly rendered profane and disenchanted. Magic and enchantment, the true sources of art, disappear from culture to be replaced by discourse. The enchanting exterior is replaced with the true interior. The enchant, oh, sorry the magic signifier with the profane signified. The place of compelling, captivating forms is taken by discursive content. Magic gives way to transparency. The imperative of transparency fosters an animosity to form. Art becomes transparent with regard to its meaning. It no longer seduces. The magic veil is cast off. And this is kind of an idea that it no longer seduces. Um, it's kind of an idea in his book, Saving Beauty, where he talks about what true beauty is. And beauty is, um, he says in that book, which I'll probably do some videos on as well, um, maybe after the Scent of Time, because the Scent of Time is my second favorite that I've read so far of his. Um, he says that beauty is not face forward. Beauty does not reveal everything. So it is hidden. It seduces. It doesn't give you everything. So I don't know. The magic veil is cast off. So I see that book at least in alignment with this one. Not all of his books align, I feel, showing sort of the evolution of his thought. The forms do not themselves talk. The language of forms, of signifiers, is characterized by compression, complexity, equivocation, exaggeration, a high degree of ambiguity that even reaches the level of contradiction. These suggest meaningfulness without immediately being reducible to meaning. All these now disappear and instead we are confronted with simplified claims and messages that are artificially imposed on the work of art. That's interesting because I was in a Twitter space not too long ago and last, sorry, there's a little fly. Summer is the season of little flying bugs. Anyway, um, where someone was asking, was kind of making the claim that postmodernism, deconstructionism, etc. has kind of, I don't remember the exact wording, has ruined the modern philosophy that is, that is true. 
And, it, you know, now I'm thinking like that sounds, I wonder if playfulness would be a way that byung Chul Han would characterize postmodernist philosophy. And if um, that is, because I was, at first I didn't understand this question, but um, after I did, I thought, well, I really can't agree with the critique because I feel like I just try to find something that I like in every sort of genre. It's a little bit hard with analytical philosophy, I have to say, but that's just because it's difficult for me. Um, but I think that the idea of play, like when I think of Derrida, I think that maybe playfulness might be a part of that line of philosophy. I don't know. You'll have to tell me if that makes sense or not. The disenchantment of art makes it Protestant in nature. Okay. It is deritualized, as it were, and stripped of its splendid forms. Quote, until the end of the 1980s, the spaces in which art was displayed still looked like Catholic churches, full of colorful forms and exuberant shapes. Since then, art societies seem to have become deeply Protestant, focusing on content and the spoken or written word. End quote. And we are actually almost finished. So we're going to do a whole chapter in a video. I'm excited. Art is not a discourse. It produces its effects through forms and signifiers and not through the signified. The process of internalization, so it doesn't tell you what to think. You know, it's not political art, I guess. That is telling you explicitly what the message is and it's making a statement. Byung Chul Han prefers art that is a little more like less revealed. And why is my, just a second. Um, I need to plug my computer in before it dies. Oh. It was just, had become a jar. All right. The process of internalization destroys the arts, bringing them closer to discourse and forsaking the mysterious outside. Han wants some mystery. Um, for the profane inside, the disenchantment of art is a symptom of narcissism of narcissistic internalization. Collective narcissism reduces eros and disenchants the world. The erotic resources of culture dry up. These resources are also the forces that hold a community together and inspire it to play and to hold festivals. Without them, society becomes atomized. Rituals and ceremonies are the genuinely human acts which allow life to appear to be an enchanting celebratory affair. Their disappearance desecrates and profanes, transforming life into mere survival. We might thus expect a re-enchantment of the world to create a healing power that could counteract collective narcissism. So my question at the end of this chapter, you know, and I guess at the end of the last chapter and maybe every chapter is, uh, you know, how do we do this? You know, first of all, do we agree with what Byung Chul Han is saying that we need? I mean, I, I think that in this book he hasn't, I mean, he's critiqued society, but not to the full extent he really could to prepare us for sort of you know, his proposal of the solution, but nevertheless, um, you know, how do we create this? How do we, do we just create rituals for ourselves and hopefully find our tribe? What counts as a ritual today? Um, 
you know, what could be a modern ritual that would still encapsulate sort of the benefits that have been found in history. So, uh, so I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the pandemic certainly isolated a lot of us and made it more difficult, you know, until we, all of us truly make the transition back, which I don't think at this time in 2022, everyone has, I certainly haven't, um, you know, until we make the transition even back to this, the state that we were in, you know, which again, you know, when was this, when was this published? Was it 2020 or 2019? Yeah, okay, 2019. So, right before the pandemic. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, I don't know. So I would just ask so far what ideas of Byung-Chul Han you agree with, which ones you don't agree with, if you have some critiques on why his or how his ideas that he's advancing could be problematic or how they could be healing, let me know. All right, uh, next time we will come back with rituals of closure and we'll just continue on with this book. Hopefully you're enjoying it, let me know. All right, bye everyone.